much. Um, I'm going to jump straight in because we talk a lot about um, consumers and how we make choices in the supermarket and I work a lot in food legislation and labelling and people have for years thought that you know, if we get the labelling right everything is going to sort itself out. We talked about traffic light labelling earlier and we've made font sizes bigger and we've done all of this. Does it make any difference? So when we look at consumers and what are we looking at on the label, what do they go for? Now bear in mind, less than 50% of consumers actually look at the food label, so that's the first thing. When they do, what are they looking for? So we've nutrition information, calories still really popular, some people are looking for allergens. I love this slide from the Food Safety Authority where 7% of people didn't know why they were looking at the food label. <laughs> um, so. When they do, what are they getting? Now we look, we see that the calorie count is the most popular aspect here. So I did a study a few years ago. We talked to 600 Irish consumers about what they understood on the label. And I got the calorie people and I said, right, you're looking at calories. Is there a difference between energy and calories? Mm -hmm. Is there? Yes. Hands up for yes. Hands up for no. Hands up for absolutely no idea. Okay. So what do we get? So, we got lots of people, we got 60% of people said confidently, yes there is, I'm looking at calories and there's a difference, and then the rest said either I don't know or no. And then I got really mean and I said, okay, 60% of you say there's a difference. Well, what is it? Anyone? <laughs> Well, we got 10% of them saying, yep, correctly could tell me what the difference is between calories and energy. And for those of you who are not sure, calories is how we measure energy. So we talk about calories of energy in the same way we would talk about grams of protein, okay? So only 10% of people could tell me that. And the fun bit was the people who said, you know, I haven't a clue. And it was a nice conversation. But what I loved most out of this was the wrong answers. Energy is kilojoules and calories are calories. <laughs> Energy is good and calories are bad, right? And my very favourite is that energy gives you vitality and calories make you fat. So we have most people looking at calories on the label with not the remotest clue about what they're actually looking at. And so where do consumers go to get information? Because the labels aren't going to do it. So then we look at newspapers, we look online, we look at bloggers, we look at health professionals. Where are we getting nutrition information? And there's lots out there, but we've already mentioned today it's very confusing. Here's some newspaper headlines. Everything you thought you knew about food is wrong. Drink tea for strong bones. Next week tea is bad for you. This week eat mushrooms to fight dementia because that's going to sort it out. And my personal favourite, chocolate can beat diabetes. This was an actual headline. Do you really think chocolate's going to beat diabetes? The only way it's going to get rid of it is in a fairly terminal way. So why are we getting so many headlines like this? And part of the problem is the number of self-appointed nutrition experts that we have in the country. And I don't know if any of you, how many people here are nutrition, nutritionists, nutrition dietitians, but anyone can be a nutritionist without ever having passed an exam, done any kind of study, nothing at all. I was researching this a little bit and you can do a two week course to be a nutritionist and if you stay on for the third week, you can be a specialist. Um, and these are the people that are, are being quoted in the media, they are writing the blogs, they are doing all of this work and this is a huge problem. And what you get there is a lot of people with low levels of knowledge but really, really high levels of confidence. And I don't know if you've come across this Dunning-Kruger effect. And what this actually looks at is a little learning is a dangerous thing. And if you see here, someone with absolutely no nutrition knowledge has no confidence about their information, and that's fine. But as soon as you get a little bit, up we go. We're 100%. We are really know what we're doing. But if you keep studying, your confidence goes right down. Because what happens? You discover that you don't know what you don't know. And suddenly the breath of what's there, you think, wow, there's so much more to this than I expected. And you'll keep studying and eventually get to this lovely position expert. I hope to be there someday. But right here, your confidence level, even as an expert, never hits the confidence level of the person with the lower level of knowledge. So what happens? We go to a debate like this or some other platform and you get the person with the real confidence and lack of knowledge and they're emphatic. Carbs are really bad, we have to stop eating them, they're causing cancer, it's the obesity crisis, it's terrible. And then the expert goes, well, you know, they're in there, they might be part of the problem, blah, blah. And someone goes, well, the expert's very wishy-washy, but he knows what he's talking about. And this is where people believe the people with the confidence roll over the people who have the actual knowledge. So what does it take to actually be an expert when it comes to nutrition? Well, this is a three to four year university degree. Three years to be a nutritionist, four years to be a dietitian. But what does that involve? Now, I know that I have friends who think I spent four years in college looking at apples and oranges and going, you know, they might be good for you. 
wish it was that easy. We did, nutrition is largely a chemistry science degree. We did organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, biochemistry, clinical biochemistry. They were all different exams I had to sit. And then we did maths, we did statistics. You know, I often talk about women in STEM. We've been doing it in nutrition for 40 years. This is not new. Um, it's over 4,000 hours of study, and that doesn't include the work you do at home on the weekends, technically, when you're not out drinking. Um, so it's a huge amount of study, and I, you know, I've encountered people who say, well, I did a nutrition course, and it was 200 hours, and you go, that's brilliant, there's about 3,800 you're missing. And if they're not getting that, what are they missing? And this huge level of confidence becomes an issue when we start tackling how we talk to consumers about nutrition. And I know we don't have a huge amount of time to look at everything on this, so I want to focus in on one or two things. One of the things that have happened with dietitians is when we have decided to go out and talk to people about nutrition, we haven't used the big scientific words. You know, when we decided we wanted to sort of talk a little bit to the general public, we didn't go out and go, right, you need 12 milligrams of vitamin E, you need 14 milligrams of iron, you need about five micrograms of vitamin D, possibly up to 30 if you're pregnant, and don't forget the decohose exonoic acid. And to the general person, they go, oh, it's meaningless. So dietitians have actually worked really, really hard to get all of this science into what we call food guidelines. So we don't talk about vitamin E, we talk about olive oil and nuts. We don't talk about iron, we talk about red meat and lentils. You know, and so the food has come in as how we talk about it, but the problem there is the science now is missed by so many people. And so we suddenly get people who go, well, nutrition, that's grand, it's just apples and oranges. I can do this. I'm a chef. I'm a doctor, I'm whatever it is, I can run out and I can do it. And I'm not slating doctors, doctors are brilliant, they get a huge amount of you know, medical training, but they get no nutrition training, but they do still often talk about nutrition. And they make the same mistakes that lots of other people do when we think that we know something about a topic when actually we don't. Now some of it is fairly straightforward, I'm sure everybody in the room is well aware that we need to eat at least five a day with fruit and veg. Okay? None of you need to spend four years at university to figure that out, we've got it. But when we get into more complex areas, this is where some of the mistakes pop in. And my favorite, I get shown the following slide quite a bit. Have you all heard that all the national food guidelines in every country in the world have actually caused the obesity crisis? <laughs> have you heard this one? Okay. I get shown, this is from the US, so this is what they did. And this is actually true, right? That we had weight around here in the 60s up to the 80s. It was here, the first food guidelines, the first food pyramid came out in America. Well, look what happened. And I get shown this and people go, see? See, the food pyramid caused the obesity crisis. Now, that's a lovely coincidence, but when you actually take it from a scientific point of view, you might dig a little deeper and go, well, did something else happen around the same time that might have had an influence? <laughs> Fast food was invented. <laughs> Now, I know I'm slightly biased, but if I was going to look at that, I might maybe look at the fast food side of things. But again, that's still coincidence. And this is where you've got to be really careful between coincidence and fact. Have a look at this slide. This is the coincidence, the big link between autism and the sale of organic foods. So down here, we had very little autism, very little organic food, but the organic food went up, and look at that, autism shot up. So it's not vaccines, people, it's organic food, all right? <laughs> See, really, do you think organic food caused autism? No, it didn't, okay? But this is where you have a big coincidence, a very strong one, but it doesn't mean that it's actual fact, all right? But we still have an issue with something like obesity in Ireland today. We still need to look at how are we tackling this, and has the food pyramid caused it? Because we've charts and things, and you're going to go, we have to look at this. So in Ireland at the moment, 66% of adults are overweight or obese. That's a lot of us. Now, for the food pyramid to have caused that, wouldn't they have to be following the food pyramid? Mm -hmm. Are they? What percentage of the Irish population follows the food pyramid? 10%? Higher or lower? Lower. 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 Hello. One percent of the Irish population has ever followed the food pyramid. So people, the food pyramid could only have caused the obesity crisis if looking at pictures of it makes you fat, all right? <laughs> <laughs> so, what happens here when we're actually going to go and talk to consumers about nutrition? Because we have all this information and we have all this misinformation. So we need to do a couple of things. We need to have responsible reporting. And we have two fabulous journalists here, and Philip has been doing fantastic work with dietitian Avian Bannon, and we've got really good, solid, accurate information out there. But we need to look at that. And whether we're talk, looking online or blogging, whatever we're doing, we need to actually go to credible sources for nutrition. And that's your core registered dietitian. It is your university trained nutritionist. Because these are the people who have the actual science and the facts. 
Believe me, we don't always agree, but it's in there. We also need to educate using experts. You know, if you go to do nutrition in university, the people teaching you have an actual qualification in nutrition. But if you go to schools, if you go to higher education, post-primary, the people there rarely have nutrition qualifications. And I know of one, um, I won't say where, but a person teaching on a nutrition course who doesn't believe any nutrition studies because they're all wrong. But she's teaching people who come out and name themselves nutritionists and have a piece of paper. And it's kind of scary. I also talk a lot on nutrition to primary school teachers. And invariably, every time I do that, someone comes up to me at the end and they go, I've been telling my students the wrong thing. And not because they've been mean, but they have just got the wrong information from somewhere and gone from there. And the last thing, don't knock the food pyramid without really good facts. Now, the food pyramid's not perfect, and it's never going to be. It is a general population guideline. We will have individuals who need different for sure. <coughs> But if you're willing to go and see a dietitian and get your individual advice, fantastic, and we know that works. But if we're going to talk generally, the food pyramid is a good place to start, and it only slightly looks at obesity. The food pyramid, remember, is all of nutrition. It is your iron, your calcium, it is your selenium, it's your magnesium. It's things most people don't even think about when they look at the food pyramid. And if you want to change it, remember two things. If you're going to shift things around, make sure the nutrition is right but also make sure the cost, because when we put the food pyramid together, we look at cost, because we can talk all day about all the things that influence consumers' choice in the, food, in the supermarket, but the thing that has the most profound impact on whether someone has healthy or unhealthy food in their shopping basket is actually poverty. Thank you very much.